What I'd like to talk about is the spiritual aspects of what we've been taught to think of as mental health difficulties, especially severe difficulties like those called psychosis or bipolar. My perspective is that it's unfortunate that the subjects of mental health and spirituality have gotten so separated, at least within conventional thinking. To start off, let's consider a story of a man who isolates himself and then stops eating for over a month. He starts seeing and hearing things, and a demon suggests to him that he might jump off a cliff, and then instead of dying, he would get special powers. He doesn't jump, though, and then he does come back around people. But sometime later, he's gone to a place of worship, and he's yelling at people that he thinks shouldn't be there, and he's trying to throw them out. Now, if you know our mental health system, you know this guy's experience and behavior are very likely going to get him diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. But what I just described is also the experience and behavior of Jesus when he went into the desert, fasted, was tempted by Satan, and then later came back and threw the money changers out of the temple. He definitely wasn't behaving normally for a Jewish person of his time. So that's just one example. There's a lot of ways that mental health crisis an intense spiritual experience can look very similar. So an important question is, what should we make of that resemblance? I'll briefly outline three approaches to this issue that people sometimes try. One is to say that any resemblance is misleading and that spirituality and mental problems are two very different things and that we should turn to experts to help tell us how to tell them apart. Now, second approach is the one Richard Dawkins took in his book, The God Delusion. Just dismiss all of spirituality as mental dysfunction. A third approach is to see it as more complex or possibly mixed, with useful spiritual experiences often emerging at times of crisis and breakdown. So truly spiritual experiences might coexist with some error and confusion. Now, out of these, the approach that's dominant in our culture is to believe that experts like psychiatrists can be relied on to tell if it's really a spiritual experience or just mental illness. But if you check out how they do that, you might see some problems with their method. Essentially, what they do is to say, if a person's experience is, is seriously disruptive, and if it's not normal in the person's culture, then it's illness. What that means is that anyone who's experiencing something really new to the culture, like Jesus or any kind of prophet, is likely to be identified as ill. So there's a danger that psychiatry will become a force used to suppress spiritual or cultural innovation. A second problem is that psychiatry's categorization of experience is very black and white. Once someone's odd experience is characterized as being the result of mental illness, then it's seen as worthless and meaningless, just something to be suppressed with drugs. But what if someone's experience is mixed and they have some degree of spiritual revelation along with mental and emotional troubles? In that case, what is the effect of refusing to see any possible value in what they are experiencing? If you ask a lot of mental health professionals, they will say it's a good thing to refuse to see anything positive and the experience of people who seem, for example, to be psychotic. They will say it's romanticizing psychosis to see anything positive in those kind of experiences. We are told to just see it as an illness, having nothing to do with spirituality, even if the individual sees their experience as being all about spirituality, as they not infrequently do. Now, I work with people who are experiencing what we call psychosis most every day. So I know just how awful things can get. But while I do believe that it's not a good idea to romanticize psychosis and refuse to notice anything bad about it, I would say it's also not a good idea to refuse to notice what might be positive or spiritually important within people's experience. And by doing so, to awfulize psychotic experiences. The method I use most in my therapy practice is called CBT for psychosis. And one of the most fundamental parts of this method is to aim at balanced thinking. Madness or psychosis is typically about being unbalanced, so it definitely doesn't help 
when professionals themselves have an unbalanced understanding of what's going on, as I believe they do when they awfulize or pathologize confusing experiences. One of the worst things that can happen when we awfulize experience is that we set off, we can set off a vicious cycle where people get more scared of their experiences and then that fear and avoidance of their experience makes their mental disorder worse. It's interesting to reflect a bit on the way trying to reject experiences we think we shouldn't have and being grasping of experiences we do want to have affects mental health in general. Now, when we don't want to have an experience and we think we shouldn't have it, we often inadvertently make ourselves have more of it. Like if we really don't want to feel anxious and then we get start feeling a little anxious, we might get anxious about the fact that we're starting to feel anxious and then the anxiety just starts to snowball. Or if we really don't want to feel depressed, then we might get depressed about the fact that we're starting to have some depressed feelings and that can snowball. Grasping at positive feelings can also cause a problem. When we just want to feel good, we might start pushing away any feeling or thought related to any self-criticism or, or need to slow down. And this can make us get carried away with ourselves and get impulsive and even manic in a way that can snowball also. Now, I want to contrast those kind of unbalanced, balanced, snowballing kind of states with the perspective of the 19th century rabbi, uh, Simcha Bunim. He, his idea was that it's helpful to have something like two pockets. So in the right-hand pocket can be a statement, something like, for my sake was this world created. Or even as I heard it once, I am one with the universe. I am the divine. I am everything. Well, that's pretty grandiose, but it also carries a truth about our essential oneness. And the left-hand pocket can be a statement like, I am but a speck of dust existing for but a moment in time. That's pretty humbling or even depressing, but also true in a sense. Now, the rabbi's idea was that when feeling low or depressed, one might reach in the right-hand pocket and feel uplifted. While if one is feeling high and mighty and carried away with oneself, one might reach in the left-hand pocket and access some humility. One thing I really like about that story is that it's about having access to and finding spiritual value in extreme states of consciousness or extreme perspectives because both of those statements are, are extreme but when you take them together it allows you to be healthy and balanced in a non-grasping way we might say that the rabbi is bipolar in a spiritually informed sense uh, Chris Cole is a modern guy who talks about the same kind of stuff, for example, in his YouTube videos about what he calls being bipolar in order. He's a guy that was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, who then tried being a Buddhist monk for a while, and eventually he learned to accept his extremes as being of spiritual value as long as he kept them in perspective as just part of a bigger picture. It's actually not that uncommon that people will first experience extreme states of consciousness in an unbalanced way, and then get lost and confused, and only later, if they're lucky and have help, learn to integrate those extremes in a balanced way like the rabbi did. That's my own experience. When I was a kid, I suffered lots of abuse, both at home and outside of home where I was severely bullied. Incidentally, abuse and bullying is a major cause of later mental health problems, more so than biological factors if you look into it. But anyway, I went on to find myself at 17 years old and the abuse and bullying had ended, but inside I still felt crushed. So then I found a solution to that. It started with using psychedelic drugs, but quickly went beyond that as I started thinking of myself as a completely new being with new ways of thinking and seeing. I would often see myself as God, able to recreate the world by seeing it differently. Now, unlike some people who think they're God, I was open to the idea that other people are also really God, but since they weren't aware of it like I was, they were really more like insects or robots compared to me. And during this time, I, I often even rejected the usual ways of making sense. So I often talked or even wrote letters in ways that made no or very little sense to others. Sometimes it was also very scary to me that I struggled to make sense of myself. 
But one thing that gave me some perspective on what I was going through was reading stuff by both radical mental health writers like R.D. Lang and mystical literature like the writings of William Blake and Alan Watts and books like The Cloud of Unknowing. And over the course of a few years, I almost always had at least one person I could talk to who saw something meaningful in my experience. A big fear I had at the time was that important others would just see me as mentally ill with my efforts to redefine myself seen as meaningless aspects of a disease rather than as the most precious aspects of my spiritual self struggling to survive and find meaning. Eventually, I found more people who took an interest in my wild perspectives. And as they showed more interest in me, I started showing more interest in making sense to them. And eventually I no longer came across as crazy. So I never did get any psychiatric treatment. And now I can look back on that time in my life as being when I made lots of spiritual discoveries that really set the foundation for my successful adult life. But later, several of my younger siblings started experiencing their own wild mental states. And unlike me, they were sent to mental hospitals and told their experiences were just due to illness, with no interest shown in what might be positive in their experience. It was seeing this mistreatment of family members and also of some friends that got me interested in becoming a therapist and trying to pioneer better ways of helping people with these kind of challenges. So I believe that if we really wanna get better at helping people, we need to do a couple things in particular. One is to get better at wrapping our, our minds around all the research that's now showing that adverse experiences and trauma typically plays a crucial role in throwing people into the states that we call mental illness. A second thing is noticing how trauma also throws us into the zone where we face big spiritual questions. And so trauma and mental health and spirituality are all very related. Now we all know the saying that it's very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Often we take that to be referring just to monetary riches. But being rich can also be seen as having a life free of trauma and serious losses. Because when things go well for us, we may just rely on those things. And relying on things can get in the way of turning to spirit. Trauma, on the other hand, cracks open a hole in our lives and in our minds. Psychiatrist Sandra Bloom is one who's good at describing how trauma disturbs our frame of reference and brings into question our beliefs about self, world, causality, and purpose. There's a saying that there's some things you just can't unsee. You can't go back to totally mundane ways of seeing the world after very dark things happen. People have to access something spiritual in order to integrate the existence of darkness without being overwhelmed. It's also important to recognize that the effects of trauma are not all just at the time of trauma. For example, my story is like that of a lot of traumatized young people. At the time when I was being abused, I just, you know, pulled in and, and, and lived with a, a damaged sense of myself in the world. But when I got old enough to question my identity and question things, I rejected most everything of what I've learned about myself in the world and tried to reinvent it all. That could be described as a dangerous attempt to heal. I think of it more like something like vomiting, expelling something that's messed up, or like a revolution rather than as an illness. And it could be described as my mind cracking open. You know, lots of bad things can happen and bad ideas can get in when things open up like that. But it's also possible that the light or something new and positive can get in at that time. Joseph Campbell liked to say that the the mystic swims in the same ocean in which the psychotic flounders. Uh, it's in this floundering that people grasp on the fixed ideas to try to save themselves. Um, so then people are sometimes grabbing very strongly onto, you know, really bad ideas. And then the mental health system comes along and says what they should really grab onto is the idea that they're just mentally ill and their experience is meaningless. What might work better? To stay with the Joseph Campbell metaphor, is it possible we could assist people as they learn to swim instead of flounder? 
That is, can we help people move towards the kind of balance that the rabbi in the earlier example demonstrated? I definitely think so. To do that, I think we all who want to be helpers have to also work on being more balanced. We need to be less certain, for example, that we know what's going on in a way that's completely correct. That allows us to be curious how there might be something positive or spiritual in someone else's confusing experience. They might know something we don't. And, and when we model being less uncertain, we also set an example for those we're trying to help. They can possibly find some value in their experience while also being curious about where they might be confused or might be making mistakes. I would propose that we all do best when we're always searching for spiritual truth and sanity, but never too sure that we have it or that we have it completely. And in Taoism, they say that the way that can be spoken is not the true way. Just as in many spiritual traditions, Im any image of God or the divine is understood to be not the true one. Uh, we, we need rather a living interest in an ongoing process of discovery of the way or the divine as we engage with the world and with each other. The, the terrible thing about modern psychiatric ideas about mental illness is that we are taught to lose interest in that kind of engagement with the diagnosed person because the diagnosed person's views and experiences are framed as just being meaningless symptoms of an illness. What I'm suggesting would work better is engagement and dialogue with those who seem crazy and for each of us to engage in dialogue with the parts of ourselves that seem crazy with the understanding that even though those people or those voices within us may be misguided in many ways they may perhaps also have part of the truth that we don't have. Now, some other ways that dialogue with apparently insane people or insane parts of ourselves can be helpful or a little paradoxical. Uh, when I was going through my own wild experiences, I was very impressed by a, a William Blake quote, and that is, the fool who persists in his folly will become wise. You know, sometimes it's our encounter with the opposite of truth that becomes for us an enlightening experience. For example, I knew a guy who had the habit of just believing or acting on whatever a voice that he believed to be a spiritual being would tell him. And finally, the voice told him, you know, I'm just telling you all this so that you'll learn to be less gullible. <laughs> uh, learn skepticism. And often people can learn to find value um, in what initially seemed to be very negative experience, that's another kind of thing that can happen. One guy was disturbed for years, for example, by voices that would make him feel very vulnerable. So he'd fight them. He didn't want to feel that way. But later he realized he'd spent years denying not just the voices, but any feelings of vulnerability. And um, he noticed that he could instead have the option of using the voices as a reminder that he did have vulnerability and that was part of life. So now the voices were something helpful to him instead of something he had to fight. Now a lot of this stuff can get pretty tricky, but you don't have to know all the tricks to be able to be helpful to people having the kind of experiences I've been talking about. One thing you can do is just be more open to talking with people about any confusing or disturbing experiences with an awareness there might be meaning in them and and something of value might be mixed in with any confusion or errors. A second thing you can do is support reshaping our mental health system so that it will support people in working through these experiences rather than just framing them as pathology to be suppressed. A third thing you can do is support people having access to peer groups like hearing voices groups where alternative views can be explored in an open-minded way. Anyway, thanks for opening your minds to allow me to talk about this subject. All right.